hopefully everyone is uh, getting awake. I think uh, if you're not wide awake now after Marcus's presentation, you will be. Um, happy to introduce uh, Marcus Raynham, CSO of Tenable. Uh, we're very happy to have him here speaking today. Um, I've known Marcus for, for many years. Uh, I think that uh, one, of the one of the good things that Marcus brings to our industry is he's very outspoken, often takes contrarian opinions, um, and he's, he's not afraid to tell, tell it like it is. So um, with that, uh, thank you for coming, Marcus. Thank you. Um, I don't want to be thought of as a contrarian, actually. It's just what I think. I'm not thinking what I think be, to be opposite to anybody. Uh, the original idea of this was I was going to see if I could get a little bit retro and do the whole presentation as ASCII art um, because a couple of us were talking about the, the problem with advancing technology and how it tends to leave our ability to use it safely in the dust, and um, which is really the gist of this talk. I just gave it right there. Um, it turned out to be very difficult to actually produce ASCII art on a screen without a windowing system, which kind of defeats the entire point. If you're trying to say, I want to be retro and not have all this insecure crap running on my system, I'm going to use a, 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 a character cell-based interface. But anyway, and also for those of you on the Twitter, yes, puppies are cute. Um, OK, so what I wanted to do is talk about uh, the results of 20 years on my part of being involved in the security industry and watching what's been happening. Uh, last year, I had a couple of things happen that triggered, uh, basically triggered these thoughts. Um, it was two things. One was a forensic response that I got involved in, and the other was an argument that I got in with another industry figure, which made me think really hard about how did we get here and um, what is the underlying dysfunction in the computer security industry? Um, I've noticed at this conference that the overall tone of presentations about the industry has been, to put it generously, downbeat. Uh, it used to be that I was one of the few people who was a bit downbeat about the industry. And now it seems like uh, there's this wave of people coming over to join me here on the dark side, um, which is depressing. But I think that one of the most important things about overcoming dysfunction is realizing that you have a problem. And if you look at the, you know, in a, in a nutshell, if you look at the computer security industry and you look at the, the state of software, there are numerous things that we're doing all over the place in computer security where our efforts are utterly failing. They're obviously failing, right? If you look at the, like, the rate at which vulnerabilities are being found, uh, the rate at which systems are being compromised, it's clear that the things that we are doing are not working. And the industry's response in those cases where things are not working is, well, let's just do them harder. Right? So if you're trying to butt your head through a brick wall, butting your head through a brick wall uh, harder is not the correct response. In some cases, we may need to sit back and try to think of what is a rational plan B. At that point, some of you could say, well, you know, what is plan B? I don't know. Um, I'm just trying to identify the problem. Um, but what I'd like to do in this talk is discuss a little bit about how some of those problems occur um, at a management level. Now, uh, I, actually wrote, I actually wrote this talk before um, the big stock market, uh, what is it, a retrograde motion or whatever it is that you want to call it. Um, right, in, in, in military history, we, we call it an advance to the rear instead of a retreat. Um, but uh, it has now become a little bit fashionable to bash management. Um, I just wanted to say I've been bashing management for a long time. This isn't a new trend. Um, but so what's the problem? The problem in a nutshell, the reason we have this disaster is because we're doing very dangerous things in some cases, and people think that it's being done safely. That's a big problem. And when I got involved in, in this, this forensic incident last year, um, there was a very interesting situation where senior executives that were involved in this problem, their view was basically, we thought it was OK. And the technical guys in the field's view was, we told you so. Right? So there was this complete, completely immiscible layer between the, 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 
the two portions of what was going on where there were utterly different views of the situation as it had evolved. And so here's the interesting question I, I started asking, which is how did an organization exist for five years in a state where senior management was in la-la land and the guys in the trenches were dealing with what turned out to be reality, right? But it could have been exactly the opposite way around. It could have been the guys in the trenches were completely wrong and that senior management was right. No, just kidding. Um, uh, but, <clears throat> But the, the problem, the problem in, in a nutshell is if you're in a situation where senior executives are showing this level of complete incomprehension about what's going on, that simply encourages increased exposure, right? Um, and there's a couple of places where, you know, I, I, I think this is going to come back to bite us. Well, after all, we were, able to make a, we were able to make a ton of money by pushing certain portions of our critical infrastructure out onto the web. It hasn't killed us yet. So let's push all of it out, da-da, cloud computing. Um, and right then we'll be at a point where some number of years in the future, we're going to be looking at the state of affairs that we have evolved into and going, well, how in the hell did we get here? Right. Um, so that's kind of what we're, what, what we're going to be looking at. Right. And I'm starting to think that we're at a point where cyber terror becomes a legitimate fear. I don't want to talk too much about cyber terror, but it's just, to me, it is a fascinating question. Every time I go to a security conference, and you know, a bunch of us will sit around in the hotel bar drinking or whatever, and it becomes security practitioners get into this weird contest, and it's, it's, it'd be a great thing to have at a, you know, something like DEF CON would be the if I were a cyber terrorist panel, right? So all the right. Well, if I were a cyber terrorist, I could collapse the United States with just the fingers on my left hand and then some other guys go oh I could just do it with my nose you know and it gets more and more you know give me give me one packet in my left nostril and I will crush the global infrastructure um, but you know we're getting to the point where this is starting to become a legitimate fear a fascinating question to me is given that that a bunch of you know moderately smart people like the, the like us can come up with all these horrifying scenarios how long is the lag time going to be before somebody actually start, who, who's actually motivated to do something nasty is going to go, wow, I, you know, I went to this presentation at DEF CON, let's, let's give this a shot. Um, and you know, here's this guy who said, he, he gave us the whole roadmap for an operation, let's invest some time in it and see if we can actually do something. Right, so there's a point where this starts to become a legitimate fear. My concern is that we are at that point or we passed it. Right? And the thing that I don't want to see happen is, 10 years from now for people to be going, wow, you know, we passed that point back in 2008 and then from then on it was inevitable that this was going to happen, all right? Which is where I, I kind of feel things are gonna, are gonna wind up. All right, so here's, the, here's a piece of the discussion that got me started on all of this. I, um, like most, of, most um, thoughtful security people, I've been known to disagree with Alan Pollard occasionally. Um, and basically, Pollard's view, as he, as he explained it in, in a public forum, was we had had a bunch of whiners who were trying to hold back business enablement. And this is a common view. I wound up getting into this tussle with Alan because it is a common view, and he made the mistake of voicing it in a forum where I could jump all over him. Um, but I would guess that I, I don't really have a number, but I would guess that probably half of the executives that I've talked about security to have this feeling, right? If you talk to the guys in sales or marketing, all of them have this feeling about security practitioners. We are a bunch of annoying whiners who are constantly saying, no, don't do that, no, don't do that, don't put that in your mouth, it's bad, right? All of these kinds of things, and of course what they want to do is, is whatever it is that they, you know, we, we, we really need 3D animated dancing pigs on the website, and we're going to do that regardless of what you want, right? <clears throat> now, Pollard's view is essentially that security is going to get pushed out of the way because we're not doing a good enough job of business enablement. Right. Either way, we're going to get pushed out of the way. Either we're going to enable business, which means that security is going to always take back seat to, to dangerous decisions, or security is going to get swept out of the way anyway. So <clears throat> that's what I was jumping on Alan about, because basically either way you look at it, we're screwed. Or not necessarily screwed, sorry, I'm jumping to my presum presumptions there. Either way, we're looking at it, security is going to wind up in the back seat while business drives. Most people in the room are thinking, well, there's nothing new about that, and that's the problem, 
right? Because if that is the case, then his view that we've been, that we've been an impediment to business all along is not true. Right? In fact, that's, that's my view, is that we've actually never been able to slow down this particular train wreck that's in, that's in the process of happening. Right? So the existing scope of the problem may indicate that uh, the, 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 the case is that security has never been able to, to act as an impediment to business moving forward. And that could very easily be one of the reasons why we have an industry in which there are hundreds of millions of people using an operating system that was really just a pimped up program loader with a Windows interface on top of it um, for business critical applications. That's a really bad thing. So what are some things that we can do that will or will not work? Right? And these are things that I don't think will work. So <clears throat> just to clarify, because I, 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 I think I just dodged around a fairly important point. I think we're already screwed. Right? It just hasn't bitten us yet. To use an analogy, which, which I probably shouldn't do, but to use an analogy, it, it's like once you've jumped out of the airplane and are plummeting towards the ground at near terminal velocity, is not the time to wonder if you brought your parachute. Right? You want to have all that stuff prepped before you jump out of the airplane. And what I think we've done from a security standpoint is jumped out of the airplane. And now business executives are going, well, build us a parachute, you idiot. Right? We're already on the way down. OK, so what are some things that we can do that will not work? One of the approaches that's not going to work is spending our way out of the hole. That's what we're trying to do right now. Right? We're, trying to, we're asking for more money to solve the problem. The problem with asking for more money to spend our way out of the hole is that the tools that we have to solve the problem are not going to work, because if they were going to work, they would have worked by now. If the firewalls, if the firewalls that we've been spending our money on and the antivirus and all this stuff that we were buying was going to work, you would expect that the rate of systems being penetrated would have gone down. The whole premise, the whole reason that we spend money and time on computer security is to keep the bad guys out of our system. The whole last 10 years of security has been shown, I mean, if you were to draw a graph, right, the rate of systems being penetrated is on this really horrific curve, um, which you, you, you could even have lots of fun by saying it's on an asymptotic curve and we can plot that out and by 2020 there will, no, there will be no machines on Earth that aren't owned. Right? Um, so spending our way out of the hole is not going to work. I repeat, if the premise is that the money we're spending on computer security has anything to do with computer security and the security of our current computers, if you look at the penetration rate of computers, the only rational conclusion we can make is to stop spending money because we're making things worse the harder we try. Now, there's another thing going, right? It's not simple causality. There's another element in the problem. It's not just that, it's not just that straightforward. But I think you can say that if you look at the, if you look at the cause and effect relationship, that what we're spending is completely decoupled with what we're getting. And in that case, you, know, you have to challenge the entire assumption behind which you're spending money. Right. <clears throat> so the problem is that the cost of things doing Doing, doing things right may exceed the cost of redoing it. We don't know. Nobody is making a rational cost-effective, uh, cost, uh, cost basis judgment of security expenditures. Um, let me put this another way. If you were responsible for um, a major defense agency of a government and you're spending some, number, some gigantic number of millions of dollars per year, on information technology and a significant component, let's say 7% of that, was computer security. At a certain point, a rational person would sit down and go, do we want to own our own operating system? Do we, I mean, that's not a good thing to go into. And if in the, today's environment where the idea is off-the-shelf software, that's completely contrary to the, the, the prevailing winds. But at a certain point, the question might be, do we actually want our own mission-oriented piece of software that does not have all these extraneous features that we didn't ask for, like, like people running botnets on our machines, right? A botnet running on your machine is essentially an unrequested feature, 
just like just like the ability to you know execute JavaScript in Adobe PDF or any of these other unrequested features. The botnet is an inevitable consequence of those other unrequested features. So we have this massive installed base of doing things wrong. And one of the questions that we need to ask is at what point, at what, how much will all the duct tape spit, bailing wire, and glue that we need in order to keep the train on the tracks, at what point does the cost of duct tape, spit, and glue cost, you know, overwhelm the cost of just replacing the entire train and replacing the, entire, uh, replacing the tracks? And I mentioned this uh, a, a year or so ago to, to some executives that, that were involved in this incident. And, um, all that I heard back was, was financial and technological inertia. Right? This is the way we've been doing it. This is the way we've always been doing it. It's how we're going to continue doing it because, well, this is the way we've already been doing it, right? which is fascinating logic. Okay, so one of the questions is, do we learn? Right? Are we actually learning anything in the computer security industry? Um, so there's two questions from that. One, do proactive measures actually carry any weight? Does fixing things in advance of a problem work? And there's reasons why they don't work, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. I'll get to that in a minute. The the problem is, well, excuse me, fixing things in advance of a problem may actually work, but because it's not visibly seen to be working, it's very difficult to get a management directive to actually do things that way, right? Um, the the example I gave earlier of jumping out of an airplane without a parachute, the failure is fairly obvious and the failure window there is relatively short. If it took you 25 years to hit the ground, I guarantee you, if it took you 25 years to hit the ground after jumping out of an airplane without a parachute, there would be bunches of executives hanging in the air right now going, well, are you going to fix this problem before I hit the ground or what? All right? All my buddies jumped. I jumped because that's what everybody else has been doing. Um, <clears throat> the current strategy in computer security has been disaster and patch, right? So the security practitioners keep sitting here and going, we need to fix this stuff before we have a problem. Industry says, do it anyway and we'll fix it when there's a problem. Those are in, in, in completely opposed views. And it's pretty clear which one's been winning, been winning for the last 15 years. And you can see the consequences, right? The consequences are not good. My, my prediction is that the consequences are going to get dramatically worse. Something like, for example, uh, cloud computing, just to pick on a, a, a popular topic. Well, let's push all of our stuff into the cloud. Ten years from now, if enough people push stuff out into the cloud, ten years from now, we're going to be having this conversation again, if I'm still alive. And we're going to be saying, wow, well, now what the hell do we do? All of our data is leaked all over the place. Ten years from now, you are going to be being besieged by vendors who are going to be selling you data leakage protection products for your cloud network, which if you think about that for one second, is really an utterly stupid concept. But because, you've already, because the industry is already going to the, let's push all of our sensitive business data out into the cloud, the inevitable gestation of those products is happening today, right? We've put those wheels in motion today in a way that we're never going to be able to avoid them 10 years from now. The question is, do we do something that's not stupid now? Or do we have to deal with this slew of point solutions for problems we're creating today 10 years from now? I, I didn't, uh, those sentences probably didn't parse very well, but I think, I think you got the idea, right? <clears throat> Okay, so here's the timeline of a typical disaster. I've been involved in uh, a, a fair number of IT disasters, and you know, for the for the record, I've caused a fair number of them myself. So, <clears throat> I have experience, uh, and as most of us do in this room, I have experience with IT disasters, both from the cause and from the recipient, and from as well as from the person selling uh, disaster remedy solutions. Um, <clears throat> so this is how things wind up looking. And this appears to be a typical disaster. So if you look at the way that humans approach complex problems where we're working beyond the edge of engineering, we're working beyond the edge of something we know how to do, we implement disasters using this paradigm over and over again. 
So we should be asking ourselves, is there any way of breaking that? And I, I don't have a great answer for that. But so what happens is you get a bad idea, and then someone identifies it as a bad idea. The quintessential IT disaster uh, for security looks something like this. The CEO is on the airplane. He opens the back of the US Airways magazine, and it has this article in there about cloud computing. Cloud computing, great idea. Everybody's doing it. So he comes back. He's pumped about cloud computing. You can save 90% on your IT infrastructure. He comes back and he gives, it to, he gives it to the security guy and he goes, cloud computing here, what do you think? The security guy goes, oh shit. <laughs> right? now, it, now what's usually the case is that the security guy goes, this is the 35th time this has come up this week. But um, if it's the first time the security guy has seen it, he goes, oh geez. And then he goes and he searches, thinks really hard, and frequently what happens, item point here, 2.2, memos get generated. The security guy stays up all night for a couple of nights and writes a, I've seen a couple of these documents resurface in the, in the course of a disaster. In one case, it was an absolutely, one of the best pieces of technical analysis that I've seen produced in a private, uh, private thing. It was involving a website, a website disaster. And basically, this, the, the, the security practitioners at this organization wrote this really nice, here's what we should do, here's why your idea is not so good, here's what we should do, here's mitigating controls, here's all this stuff that we need to do uh, that will, that will have, give us a slight chance of averting a disaster. So uh, it's identified as a bad idea. And then what happens is really interesting. It's, it's the process of negotiation. Okay, so you say it's a bad idea. Okay, so, so cloud computing is not such a great idea. You don't think we should push all of our data in there. So the executive is still thinking he's gonna save 90% on his IT. Then the executive makes a really bizarre mistake, which is he thinks maybe he'll be able to save 87% if they only push non-sensitive data out, right? Okay, so why don't we just push out everything except for the customers, um, the, the, the CCV and their credit cards. We'll push everything out to the cloud except for the CCV and then we're gonna be okay. All right, so this is the negotiation stage. And this goes back and forth. And again, there are memos generated, right? So we search for plan B. Here's the problem, is point five, right? This is the failure to adjust, re, readjust expectations. I've seen this over and over and again when talking to executives. He still thinks he's gonna save 90% on his IT he still thinks it's gonna be safe because that's what he asked for. He asked for a 90% savings on IT costs and he asked for it to be safe. What he got back was, at best you're gonna save 50% because we're gonna to have to spend all this time and effort on mitigating controls and it's still going to be dangerous. So the executive is still looking for his 90%. You've given him something completely different. There are memos that have been generated or emails or whatever that essentially document the fact that there's now this immiscible layer where management is expecting the moon stars and Christy Turlington and what he's actually going to get is Rosie O'Donnell. Um, <clears throat> Rosie, O'Donnell so Rosie O'Donnell and herpes. And, uh, and then 10 years later, the shock sets in, right? So, and in, in, in other situations, maybe not such a great example there, I apologize. <laughs> Sorry if that was too graphic a, a mental picture for, for you this early in the morning, but um, really that's, that's what we're talking about, right? The security practitioners are the ones who keep saying, your baby is ugly, and that's never a popular, popular position to be in. You know, hey marketing guy, no 3D dancing pigs on our website are A, going to make us less secure, and B, the customers really don't care about that stuff anyway, right? So that's the problem. We're the, we're the as Alan Powler says, we're the whiners, we're the naysayers. That's the role that we're in. Okay, so, <clears throat> and again, I've seen this. Initial failure conditions are noticed. Um, problems begin to crop up, I guarantee you, almost immediately with this. We're already beginning to see people going, wait a minute, this, this cloud computing thing, uh, where's our customer data again, right? We, 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 Chris Hoff's, pre number of us went to Chris Hoff's presentation, that was, that was brilliant. You know, there's big problems, right? So then what happens is you go into denial or you go into kludging. Here's the problem, when you're at point seven, you've al you're already screwed, that's where we are a lot. Um, in the security industry, and we're getting ready to go. We're getting ready to go in this direction in, in, in lots of other ways. Right? You're doing something that you shouldn't have done. You're already doing something that you shouldn't have done, and you're trying to make it better. To stick with the Rosie O'Donnell analogy, you're turning the room lights off and just going ahead anyway, and 
Uh, I shouldn't have stuck with that analogy. <clears throat> because, as you see, point eight, sooner or later someone flips the lights on. All right? Then begins the hunt for the guilty. Um, and this is, you know, back to the, the forensic case from last year. I got brought into this situation and it was completely bizarre. What management was saying was essentially the engineers who built this lied to us. By the way, they'll say this about all of us security people behind our backs, right? The security guys said it was okay. If the security guy's in the room, they'll say the software engineers said it was okay. And as soon as the security guy leaves the room, ah, oh, was the security guy and the software engineers said it was okay. It's never the executive's fault, right? Um, and of course, what I'm doing right now is, pre, is presaging point 10, which is the finger pointing. Oh, it's your fault. No, it's your fault. No, it's your fault. It doesn't matter. You've already got the problem. It's too late. But in cases where you're doing discovery as part of uh, litigation or uh, in, in the case that I was involved, you're, arbit you're doing some arbitration, that's when all the memos resurface. And it's absolutely fascinating when that happens. Um, uh, and then you get the, the other ones that are really great, like senior people going that they can't remember their PGP key from those days. Um, <clears throat> we just can't open that email because I can't remember my PGP key from those days. And you, know, you ask questions like, well, do you remember what your bank pin was in those days? Yeah, sure, no problem. You remember your home phone number? You know, your wife's name, all this? Yeah, but I just can't remember my PGP key. Um, and that's when the slaughter of the innocents happens, right? But the, the interesting part is, is, again, at point 13, is we, we just simply don't learn anything from how we got there. The history of the computer security industry and the history of computer security is nothing but this cycle happening over and over and over again. Let's connect to the internet so we can get to all those customers. Oh crap, uh, get me a firewall, right? Uh, you put the firewall in and then, oh crap, now we've got malware. Eh, what are we going to do about it? You go back in the archives and you'll see, you know, 15 years ago there were emails from people saying, Sooner or later, some wise ass is going to write a penetrator that knows how to go out through firewalls and let people come back in on its coattails, and then we're going to have a problem, and everybody kind of, well, we'll deal with that, you know, we'll deal with that later. Okay, so <clears throat> some of the reasons, other failures that we're going to be dealing with. Um, and I remember when I wrote these slides, they were maybe visionary, but um, <clears throat> Wall Street being a great example of the failure of risk management, the whole idea of risk management, never mind the, the numbers that you blow at it and say we've come up with these constructed probabilities of this going wrong versus these costs if it does go wrong. But the, the, the important problem with risk management is the idea that all the good thinking happens at stage three in that process that I outlined. And the problem is that most of the time we're working already at stage seven. All right. So the only actions that we can take when we're at stage seven, because we can't go back and reassess the prior probabilities of making the mistake, is trying to, to put lipstick on a pig. At the, once you've already bought the pig, and you're already in bed with the pig, you're now trying to figure out whether you can, or you're jumping out of the airplane, and now you're trying to do risk management while you're on the way down to the ground. This is a big problem, right? So I think what's fascinating is that organizations are still talking about risk management and computer security as if that's a, you know, a serious and, and a valid concept. If you want to have fun with somebody who's talking about risk management, is um, uh, here's a fun thing to do if you just want to watch their heads explode, is you say, well, have you factored into your risk management equations the consequences of choosing to use Windows as our operating system 10 years ago? Right? Well, that doesn't count. What do you mean that doesn't count? Well, it's a decision that's already made. Hang on, if you're trying to do management, risk management, you have to factor in the decisions that are already made because those are what defined your risk picture today. Oh, well, yeah. It, again, it's exactly the equivalent of trying to do risk management on Wall Street after you're already leveraged to your eyeballs. Now what you're trying to do is risk manage your way out of a situation where you're already bankrupt. There's only so much action space left for positive action once you've gotten yourself in over your uh, your ability to breathe. <clears throat> 
Another of the things that's not going to work, if you, you know, I, mean, I, I probably should have a, like a little separate slide with my, my stages, right? But <clears throat> failure of communication. Many of the security practices that we're trying to push people to do, things like the you know, software security life cycle, security life cycle, security design life cycle, educating the users, educating the customers, educating developers, all of these things, um, again, are assuming that goods, ha goods Good thinking is happening at multiple stages in the process. And in some cases, yes, we can encourage good thinking to happen in a few of the stages in the process that are past the point where we're actually able to do anything retroactively about them. Again, if you want to talk about a security design life cycle, right, which is, you know, it's a great idea, it's, and it sounds fantastic on paper, but if you have a security design life cycle, part of what you should do is retroactively reassess your decision to use Windows as a business critical operating system or to use Linux as a bit, or whatever particular pieces of toy software it is that you're using. Or um, to, you know, retroactively reassess the decision to put, you know, your process control systems online where they're accessible over a wide area network. And so what's happening a lot, especially we see this with the, the currently unfolding SCADA disaster, the SCADA disaster is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. The time to have assessed the security for SCADA was 10 years ago. We're now at the point where all we can do is argue about where the duct tape and bailing wire and spit is going to go. And the, really what we should be doing is reassessing the decision that was made 10 years ago. If I were the president, <clears throat> if I were the president, my directive would be to unplug all that crap right now. And it would make a great, you know, employment program for all the Homer Simpsons who'd have to go back to sitting and actually keeping their eyeballs on machinery that was critical. It'd be great, it would be great for the economy and I'd be seen as a tremendous visionary. Um, <clears throat> another one of the places where things go wrong is the, the, the notion of education. And you know, boy, I don't know about you, but I don't know how many times security practitioners have uttered the words, we just need to teach the executives. Here, let me give you a thought. We've been talking about teaching the executives about security for 20, 20, 30 years now, something like that. It hasn't worked. If it hasn't worked for 20 something years, why should we think it's gonna suddenly miraculously happen next month, right? If you've been doing something that's been an epic failure for 20 years, getting executives to think about anything other than their compensation or wherever it is that they're trying to take the business, why do you suddenly think it's going to work now, right? Why do you think if somebody holds a gun that says, um, you know, PCI or something like that to the executive's head, why do you think that PCI is going to make them suddenly take security seriously when they have shown a pattern of not taking it seriously for 20 years? They're not going to take security seriously. They will take PCI, secure, PCI seriously. But right, there's a huge difference between taking PCI seriously and taking security seriously. And we practitioners see PCI as taking security seriously, and we are utterly wrong. The executives are going to game their way around PCI. They're not going to take it seriously. And they're going to go, yes, yes, nice security guy. Here's, here's some bones. Go, go play in the corner. And we're going to be over in the corner. We're going to be shocked and horrified when we discover that, that well, actually, we're not. But there's going to be another disaster. Right? Now what's going to happen is, when the disaster happens, management is going to turn to us and say, you said if we did that PCI stuff, this wouldn't happen. You suck. Okay, so that's what's going to happen. Sorry, I, sorry to pop anyone's bubble. Um, which brings me to the failure of legislation. Right? Legislation is another epic failure, and a lot of security practitioners are saying we should do this, right? PCI, uh, FISMA, blah, 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 sorry, blah, blah, all these things. We see this as a good thing. I suppose it's better than nothing, but we don't really know if it's better than nothing because what we're doing is we're trying to identify failures that happened at stage seven and stage eight of the disaster life cycle. And what? So we point at someone who suffered a gigantic data leak and we say, um, all right, you know, uh, TJX has a huge data leak. We point and we say we're going to sue these guys. We're going to make them a, uh, we're going to make them a public laughing stock. We're going to you know we're going to take away the executive's late, you know his Ferrari number six, whatever it is that we're going to do, um, to show them that, that that we as an industry and as a community are really really angry with what's happened. But the problem is that you're dealing with the consequences of decisions that were made ten years ago, when the data moved off the mainframe onto departmental workgroup servers 
and from departmental work group servers, it moved onto sales guys' laptops. And then everyone's going, oh God, we're shocked and awed that sales guys' laptops that for some reason are carrying data that they never should have had any access to are getting lost in airports, right? So here's the problem. We shouldn't be having, you know, breach disclosure laws are attempting to hum humiliate people into unmaking a mistake that was made 10 years ago. I don't see how that can possibly work. Actually, the, the database mistake was made almost 20 years ago, right? And that was when people went, geez, the mainframes are too expensive. We're going to have to move this stuff down. So what's, this is why I predict to you that 10 or 15 years from now, after everything is moved into the cloud, there's going to be some legislation governing how cloud computing has to be done. And the real question is, what were you freaking idiots thinking when you put your data out in the cloud in the first place, right? Uh, of course, um, I could be completely wrong about a lot of this. I've been predicting for a long time that there's going to be this gigantic rush to in-house things, right? Uh, as a consequence of outsourcing. Let's go back into insourcing again um, once that starts to fail. But it seems that, um, that the industry and the, and the global economy's ability to ab absorb huge impacts is, is pretty good. Um, this is gonna be seen as prohibited, always seen as prohibitively expensive. Right, so at the point where somebody comes along and starts legislating, we're going to punish people who've obviously suffered the consequences of a mistake that they've made 10 years ago. It's always prohibitively expensive to unmake the mistake. So there's never going to be an incentive for people to reassess the mistakes that were made 10 or 15 years ago. They're simply stuck with the current state of affairs, which means that the, the, the business to be in is a forensic analyst or somebody who sells lipstick for pigs. Um, Another popular model for security disasters today is economic, mo economic models. I, I, I swear, whenever some security practitioner comes up and says, I want to make an economic cost, I just want to hit them at this point, because it's, it's, like, it's like cargo cult stuff. You know, if I put antennas on my head and hum the right song, John Frum is going to come along and readjust my security landscape. No, it's not going to happen, right? The, <clears throat> the problem is that when security practitioners talk about economic models, what they're really saying is, I want a seat at the table. The table's already set, the meal has already been eaten, and security practitioners are going, no, I want a seat at the table, right? The decisions were made 10 years ago. It's pointless to argue about economic models of the decisions we're making from now going forward on those decisions, right? So, so again, if you want to talk about economic models, and security should ask, where was the economic model that made it look cost justified to go, I don't know, to switch from DOS to using Windows? I mean, just a ridiculous example, but maybe it's not a bad one, right? Why do we switch from using, why do we switch from, from running DOS to Windows? If you think about that, you know, the industry just kind of did this really weird thing. When Windows came out, everybody just sort of assumed that they were going to start using it. I'm not, I'm not bashing Microsoft, but there's, there's all this kind of stuff that, people kind of just assume is going to happen as a matter of some, you know, bizarre kind of chain of chain of consequence, right? We're going to switch to using windowed systems instead of graphical, you know, instead of character cell terminals. Well, I don't know. I mean, there were some huge, fantastic, successful businesses that were, that were built just fine, you know, with character cell terminals. I'm not saying we should go back to character cell terminals. The thing I'm saying is that we should be wondering how it was we got from there to here so seamlessly and smoothly with all these dangerous decisions just sort of getting built into our life cycle without even realizing that, that was happening. Right? So the economic models are always whacked because when some security practitioner comes along and starts wants to talk about economic cost justifications, we're talking about cost justify again, you know, you're you're in the air, you're falling towards the ground, you're at terminal velocity, and you're arguing about whether or not you should have bought a more or less expensive parachute. If you were concerned about it smashing into the ground and looking like an exploded tomato, the question is, why did I jump out of an airplane? I could be on the couch right now playing PlayStation. In fact, I could be playing extreme parachuting for PlayStation. <laughs> and I could, I could like, see if I could splat myself off the side of a barn if that's what I'm trying to do, right? If what I want to do is make big red stains, I should have been playing the PlayStation version instead of the meatware version, right? So, so when, when, whenever people start talking about economic models and security, what they're really doing is they're presenting you a picture where the numbers are already cooked. The books are already cooked, and now we're arguing about what we're going to do to cook the books from, from the point where we are now. I'm sorry if I'm depressing you, um, but... <clears throat> 
you know, what can I do? Now, here's another one. Um, security practitioners do all this all the time. Okay, so my boss told me, uh, let's put everything in the cloud. Okay, so what I did is I wrote this brilliant piece of analysis telling him why that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard of. He says, well, let's put it in the cloud anyway. I said, okay, well, I gave you this memo telling you it was a bad idea. I want you to sign on the dotted line that you're taking full responsibility. Of course he's going to sign. Why? Because he's getting paid $300,000 a year and he really doesn't care. Of course, if he fails, if the company explodes, he's going to exercise his golden parachute. He may lose a little bit of money. He's going to go on to someplace else. Now, when I used to talk about this, everybody would go, oh, man, Marcus, you're just really being cynical. Uh, the current events in Wall Street uh, you know, really point out, um, actually, that the situation was vastly worse than I imagined it was, right? Because when you look at things like Choice Point, well, T Choice, Point, Choice Point CEO is still there. It's a great example, okay? So Choice Point causes this epic failure. Um, his C the CEO is still there. It hasn't hurt him personally. It may have hurt his stock values, but don't, don't, don't worry too much about that. He's probably making enough money in cash, too. Um, many of the executives from companies that have suffered um, epic data losses, you know, maybe they've lost their jobs or whatever, but they're, running, they're, they're, they're working at some other company as an executive now, and they're busy building the next disaster. Right? Whereas the shareholders and the technical people from the company are, are running around scrambling around trying to figure out how much lipstick they can buy to put on the pig that they've inherited. So asking, asking management to take full responsibility is absolutely pointless because their appetite for risk, as we've seen, is infinite. Because it's not their risk. Now, if we were to say that managers who are responsible for data leakage were going to be shot, and we actually shot them, we might see some change there. But I think it would, it would require that level of epic intervention, right? There was a, 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 a emperor of Korea, one, I don't know if Korea is big enough to have emperors, but there was a king of Korea back, back a zillion years ago, and, and they had, apparently they had a problem with scribes, and so he basically said, um, you know, if you make too many transcription errors, your fingers will be cut off. If you make more than a certain number of transcription errors, your fingers get cut off. And, um, you know, maybe that's what we need to do. Instead of having uh, data, um, uh, you know, uh, data breach notification laws, we should have uh, actual punishment. And this is a place where uh, I, I know people think I'm crazy, but data breach notification laws are absolutely stupid because what you're doing is you're basically saying, you know, dear customer, you are screwed. I, I, my responsibilities at the point where I've told you you're screwed, my responsibilities end. Um, whereas what we really need to be doing is saying, you know, you, you lose your job, right? Um, this really needs to happen inside the government. I have not yet in 15 years managed to find a case where some government IT manager has lost their job as a result of data security problems. There have been co endless numbers of contractors who've gotten a little ruler slapped across their knuckles. You know, bang, okay, you can't work for the Department of Big Round Things anymore. You have to go work for the Department of Little Fuzzy Objects over there and do the same dumb thing that we told you to do over here, right? But at the point where we're talking about national security issues, you know, the failure of Nippernet to be kept as a secure network, nobody's ever going to suffer from that. What's going to happen? Well, actually, I shouldn't have said that. Somebody is going to suffer for the failure to keep Nippernet as a, a secure, and it's going to be the American taxpayer, because what's going to happen is 10 years from now, someone's going to come along and go, oh, God, we need a whole new network for the DOD, right? And, the, and then the, the money is going to be given to the same idiots who built Nippernet. And we're going to have exactly the same problem over and over again. Let's look closer at what's happening. So um, according to Alan, security has to enable business. And, and in cases where failures occur, it's been discovered the technologists lied about how safe the systems were. Right? So it's, you know, right, we lied. So there's this huge disconnection between what management thinks and what engineering and technical people think or what security strategists think. Right? So my observation back to Alan was the technologists told the truth, the management simply didn't hear it. And in these forensic cases I've been involved in, uh, trying to unroll some of these disasters, um, I've served as a witness so far in, in three different arbitrations involving software security, system security failures. It's really interesting stuff. right? big quiet lawsuits that happen, and I can't talk about the way that they get settled out. But um, what happens is management remembers what they asked for, not what they heard in response, right? We're going to save 90% on our IT budget by pushing everything out in the cloud. Um, go make it happen, right? And Chris says, no, we can't do that. We can save you 5% or whatever. And I go, okay, fine, whatever, and it'll be completely, right? And he says, 
you can save 5% and it, our data is going to be exposed. I'm like, I oh, yeah, whatever, right? Um, and then 10 years later when there's a problem, I go, well, I, you, I told you to do it safely, right? And then you get this really weird situation where he goes, no, here's the email I sent you on this particular date. It's, we pulled it up off the backup tape. This is where I told you um, that you were, you were smoking crack. Um, the other thing that happens is the plan A, plan B effect. If you ever work for an organization where management shops a bad idea, I call these bad idea zombies, okay? Um, if you ever work for an organization like that, you can pretty much predict that the organization is going to fail and that you're going to get blamed for it, but that's just sort of a side effect. So bad idea zombies happen. The guy comes back. He read the article in uh, the US Air Online you know, in-flight magazine. Cloud computing is an absolutely fantastic idea. Um, the security guys say it can't be done. The technical people say it can't be done. So he goes to the marketing people. The marketing people say, sounds great. Right? So what does management do? Management now has the picture and says, well, sounds great. They forget the, the 15 naysayers who are the domain experts, and they simply remember the clueless idiots. The last time I saw one of these, was involved in one of these, it, it, was, it was just it was epic. Um, management went and said, we want to do blah, blah, blah on the website. Security said, bad idea, here's why, right? Nice, clean analysis. Management goes to the marketing people and basically says, I want to do blah, blah, blah for the website. The marketing people say, we know a graphic artist and a web guy who can do that. So, boom, management, great, make it happen. So the, web, the marketing guys go out, they spend the money, they, get, they do the whole thing, and then security, six months later, security basically gets dragged in and says, this whole new thing is going live next week. We want you to do a review before we push it out. And essentially, it's exactly what the security guy said, no, don't do that, right? So to, you know, to go back to our analogy, I propose to jump out of an airplane without a parachute. What do you think? And everybody in the room goes, no, bad idea. Of course, most of you are probably thinking, yes, please, Marcus, jump out of a plane without a parachute. But um, you know, everybody goes, no, that's a really bad idea. I jump out. Uh, then I go to, I go to uh, somebody who really hates me. Right, and and you know, Greg says, "Yeah, I think it's a great idea." So I do it, and then I come back and I say, um, "You know, uh, okay, now what do I do?" <laughs> right, save me. Uh, it doesn't work. Okay, so I've seen this happen in several companies where I've worked, several companies that I've run, uh, where basically you just keep shopping this bad idea zombie around until sooner or later somebody bleeds on it and it comes to life and it keeps staggering around and people keep putting lipstick on it. Um, okay, so, so the problem with all of this, and this is, this is the problem consistently across, the, you know, across all of security for the last 20 years, is that the expectation level does not get reset in the process of reassessment. We're constantly dealing with where we are in the standing wave that is reality, and nobody goes back and says, wait a minute, we need to reset our expectations to go back here. One of the fun things that would be, you know, if you really, again, you want to make see uh, managers' heads explode, is go, well, you know, You've decided to run your mission critical operations on an operating system that, that, that you know, I don't know, I wouldn't put it in my PlayStation. Um, what do you expect, right? Force them to reassess the decisions that were made 15 years ago in the context of the problems that are going on now, not, you know, turn off JavaScript in your browser. Um, so management continues to just keep forging ahead, and you, you've all seen this, unfortunately. The best example of this kind of failure that I've ever run across is the, the, the space shuttle disasters. Uh, if you have not read Richard Feynman's memor uh, minority report on the Challenger disaster, I, I'll give you guys all a reading assignment. Go out and read it. Uh, there's links to it on my website if you need a link to it. Um, if you don't understand how Google works, but just search for Feynman personal observations on the Challenger disaster. But basically what he does is he documents this entire process happening at NASA over and over again, right? And it's, it's down to the memos. There's engineers going, you know, guys, the, you know, the design, you know, the design of the, the solid rocket boosters is, hey, we really should reassess it. And basically people are, people are going, well, we've spent a billion dollars on them. We're not going to go back to Congress for another billion dollars to rebuild solid rocket boosters, right? There's a big problem with this. So you see this dis disconnection between expectation and reality. What wound up happening was, um, uh, now, this is not described in Feynman's memorial, m Minority Report. There's a, there's a book, there's a, an article he wrote 
shortly before his death called Mr. Feynman Goes to Washington, in which he describes his discussions with some of the engineers. He'd go to these engineers, the guys who were building the, the, the space shuttles, and go, you know, what do you think the chances of a failure of a space shuttle? And he was getting answers like one in 15, which turned out to be about right. Um, you know, one in 15, one in 100, one in 200. And if you went to NASA management, uh, they would say one in 200,000, which is amazing, right? One in 200,000 means that the space shuttle is orders of two orders of magnitude safer than commercial aviation, right? Now, we've lost two of them in the last whatever. Obviously, it's not. If space shuttles were as reliable, if you were to fly as many space shuttles with the current trailing probabilities of failures, and of course I think the forward-looking probabilities of failures go up as the system wears, right, if you were to fly as many space shuttles as we fly commercial planes, they would be falling in people's backyards four or five a day. Um, so there's this big disconnect between management and engineering, and the way that that happened at NASA was basically naysayers going, this is a bad idea, 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 and imagine, well, we're going to do it anyway. Okay, so what do we do? The, the best thing we can do is to ensure maximum clarity at all parts of the process. You really want to ensure clarity at stage two, three, and not waffle, all right? I suppose you can pre-allocate blame. Pre-allocating blame, right, you know, if, you, if you kind of go back to my chart, if you start trying to pre-allocate blame, um, was that Amit that was talking about that yesterday? I think it was. If you pre-allocate blame, it only happens at stage seven and eight. The bad idea is already set, for, the bad idea is already set, set in stone, right? Pre-allocating blame is okay from a personal level, but if you find yourself in a situation where you're pre-allocating blame for an, uh, an incipient disaster, I submit to you that you're accepting intellectually, even though you're, you're not coping with it, you're accepting intellectually the disaster is going to happen, right? That's why you're pre-allocating blame. So you're all falling down at terminal velocity and you're going, ah, it's not my fault that, you, you know, that you're going to make a red stain on the ground in a couple of minutes. All right, so technical people need to be absolutely certain that they're documenting all the warnings that they issue at stage eight. Keep all that stuff. If you ever send an email to anybody or a memo to anybody saying this is going to be a problem someday, even if it's 10 or 15 years from now, make sure that you keep it. I used to, unfortunately, because of some intellectual property disputes, I wound up losing my entire email archive a number of years ago, but I've been building it back up. I used to have every email I'd ever sent or received, every memo electronically that I'd ever sent or received, and it gives you tremendous leverage at saying, I told you so, right? It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get your butt out of a crack. You're still going to make a red splat mark on the ground, but it is nice to be the guy as you're falling that goes, I told you so, right? Um, so, some key phrases to use with management. We must reassess the decision to, bah, now put this in your memos. We must reassess the decision to switch from DOS to Windows. I mean, that's, that's visionary. If you put that in your memos, you're, you're a visionary. You're rear looking, right? So what you're doing is you're, you're not pre-allocating blame, you're like post-dating blame. That's brilliant visionary stuff, right? Risk estimate regarding blank is optim optimistic, whatever it is. Or if you really want to, if, if people are really talking about risk estimates, is to simply just go for the jugular and say, you know, the notion of risk management is pointless, therefore the risk estimate for blah is meaningless. Put that in your memos. Managers will look at that and go, wow, we're going to do it anyway. But um, <laughs> you'll get to say, I told you so, and that's really cool, right? This is another key phrase. Continuing with blank represents additional investment in a risky decision. Again, you're post-dating blame. Don't pre-allocate blame, backdate blame. Okay, so I think that, the, that we've got a really grim future ahead of us. And the reason is, if you look at this from the, the kind of meta picture that I'm talking about, human optimism is going to always force us to make these kinds of mistakes. Because of the way that humans work, we look at where we are right now in the standing wave of reality. And because of how causality functions, we kind of go, well, the stuff in the past I can't change, which is true, right? I can't change any of the stuff that's in the past. I can only change stuff in the future going forward. So magically, we stop reassessing all the stuff in the past. I just have to deal with the reality that is. All quite true. But because I have to deal with the reality that is, I am blinded from asking, is there any way I can get back here? Is this the right thing to do? Right? Do I, 
you know, we need a mission critical, let's say we need a computing platform for mission critical computing. It needs to be secure. All of our stuff is all web delivered. Maybe instead of asking ourselves how we can lock down Microsoft Windows or Linux to the point where it's secure, maybe what we want to do is think about developing a micro tamper-proof operating system that has a small tamper-proof browser that boots on a PlayStation handheld or some kind of embedded hardware where we can control the hardware footprint. We can, right? You have to reassess the past in order to be able to have more control over the future because otherwise we're, we're all falling from the airplane and we're just trying to decide whether we want to make like a, a splat mark that's this way or if we want to land feet first and try to make like a conical splat mark. Um, and you know, so all of the stuff that's being happening, that's being done, and I, I need to wrap up, but all the stuff that's being done right now to bring compliant systems into compliant with regulations is a completely wasted effort. PCI and all that stuff, uh, it sounds great. I, I, I do sort of, on, in principle, favor PCI. But what PCI represents, if you look at the PCI standards, it represents a pretty good laundry list of stuff you should have done 15 years ago. So what PCI is doing is coming along and saying, oh, this is how screwed you are. But nobody sees it that way. Security practitioners just go, oh, PCI is great. No, PCI is a diagnosis of terminal disease. Okay, Web 2.0 and the rapid adaptation of Web 2.0, the use of, Java, of JavaScript for crying out loud. You know, let's turn JavaScript into the microcode for the internet and, and do Web 2.0, right? This is going to be horrible. We've already seen that there's huge problems with that particular architecture, but, ooh, 3D dancing pigs. The fact that I can write a website and I can live link his 3D dancing pigs in so I don't even have to understand what they're doing. This is great. I can have 3D dancing pigs without even understanding what they're doing. It's wonderful. Um, so, again, I, it's not rocket science, but I'm predicting that Web 2.0 is going to keep uh, the younger ones of you well employed well into your dotage. Um, so we need to understand that as failures get more complex, we still have to understand the failures. We have to understand what went wrong. This one really scared me. The, the forensic case that I was involved in last year that I mentioned earlier, the client when the problem started happening, the, 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 one of the, the parties that was involved in this arbitration, it actually made no effort to find out what was going wrong. They were simply slapping a fix on it. This would be kind of like if you're in your house and, and you walk into your living room and there's rain on the floor, you put a bucket there. You don't ask yourself if there's a leak in the roof or where the leak is or if how many leaks there are or if it's just that the shower upstairs has got a... You don't ask what the problem is. You simply deal with the symptoms, right? And we see this all the time. If you continue to just deal with the symptoms, I guarantee you, you will have an infinity of problems. And that's kind of what started to happen with some of this stuff. And in fact, many of the pieces of code that we're dealing with are so complex that it is getting to the point where it is impossible to find out where the failure is. Right? That is kind of what the symptom of virtual machines is because we've been unable to crack the problem of building an operating system that's reliable enough to stand alone. And it, those of you who remember operating systems in the 70s and 80s, the idea of an operating system was that it separates two processes together and gives each of them its own little virtual address space. Because we couldn't write operating systems that did that. Well, we could, but nobody used them. But um, they all used Windows and Linux instead. Um, but because nobody used those operating systems, now we build virtual machines to do what operating systems were supposed to do. So you have an operating system that's running a single program, and you build that virtual machine. That's what operating systems should have done. So a prediction again, virtual machines are going to fail to give any kind of security advantages for exactly the same reason that desktop operating systems fail to give any kind of security advantages. Right? So um, the, models of dis the models of fixing this stuff are completely broken going forward. So I hope I didn't depress you too much. I'm out of time. I'm convinced the situation is not only beyond repair, it's getting worse, which is really good news if, if you're on the, on the downside. Um, career advice, uh, if you're looking at security, uh, my, my recommendation would be on the side of causing the problems rather than on the side of fixing them. Um, <laughs> So that would mean that you know those of you who are vulnerability researchers are going to be fat, dumb, and happy going forward. Those of us who are responsible for producing software are screwed, utterly screwed. Have a nice day. Should I?
I try to take questions? No. Okay, thank you. That was... <laughs>